This is a video for General Physics 1 covering the concepts of acceleration on an incline, friction, and inertia. Do watch this video in place of class on February 9th and do the worksheet that's posted on Blackboard and the Learning Catalytics self-paced session. So where we're at now is today's February 9th. So we're starting chapter four as we finish up the end of chapter three. The chapter numbers, you remember, refer to the numbering in the e-text version or the original version of principles and practice of physics. Refer to the syllabus for all uh, dates, due dates, and chapters. Notes on where we're at. Usual office hours and pure tutoring hours are given here. However, due to the weather, I will have some availability on Thursday, February 9th, from 2 to 4 in Science Hall 275, and also Friday, February 10th, from 11 to 12. The usual Thursday night office hours, because of inaccessible uh, locations due to the weather, won't be happening. The, uh, there is also a peer tutoring with Matt on Friday from 2.30 to 4. Do attend that for help with homework. All right, so your blog posts are going to be, as we've been discussing, a short calculation and example um, of physics in the world. So your particular example should relate to physics that we've studied so far in class. That means if you posted a blog post now, it would relate to something about acceleration, motion, velocity, uh, and whatever we're getting into um, today, for example. You can look at the um, slightly adjusted syllabus for blog post dates. The first blog post is due on or before March 2nd, and the second blog post is due on or before April 13th. Today, this video is going to talk about concepts of acceleration on an incline and interactions, which means what happens when you have more than one object that's interacting, that are interacting. So we need to consider concepts of inertia and friction. Uh, the assignments after today are a self-paced learning catalytics um, module that you can access on Learning Catalytics, and this must be completed for class credit, just like if you were doing Learning Catalytics questions in class, except these are a little bit more involved. There is also a Worksheet 5 on Blackboard that you can complete at the end of this module, there are, or this video, there are answers at the end of the video. So when we launch right into inclined planes here, you may have seen these in lab already, you probably have, and you've been studying acceleration by rolling things down an inclined plane. This goes back to Galileo, where Galileo actually used inclined planes to examine the motion of objects that are accelerated because of gravity. If you have a, an inclined plane, the only thing that's making it roll downhill is gravity, which makes things roll down right, or fall down. And what he found experimentally is that there was a particular ratio between the distance traveled to the square of the amount of time it took to travel that distance. In other words, for any, at any position, x1, x2, and x3, the time it took would be related to the position by x1 over t1 squared which would be equal to x2 over t2 squared, which would be equal to x3 over t3 squared, etc. So that would be a constant. We can actually do that from the equations that we've used already, too. We were, we've worked with an equation, if you have a zero initial position and a zero initial velocity, your x final would be equal to 1 half ax t squared, and we can rewrite that as x final over t squared equals 1 half ax. In other words, x over t squared equals a constant. So we can also find, we can find the exact relationship experimentally. We'll do this later in the semester using the concepts of force and acceleration as well. But right now, what people can do 
is take data, like you did in lab or like you will do, and you could plot that data and find experimentally that the acceleration down an incline is equal to g times sine of theta, where theta is the angle of the incline. So this first picture has theta equals 15 degrees, fairly slight incline, then 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. Let's see what happens when you have sine of 90. Sine of 90 is equal to 1, and so a, x, becomes g. In other words, the acceleration along the incline is equal to g, if the thing is just falling down. So that makes sense conceptually to us. The uh, worksheet 5 and um, answers in the slides at the end here and the learning catalytics will, will give some examples of working with this relationship. So as we move on from acceleration, just the, the concepts of motion, we begin to talk about interactions between objects. So for example, interaction of moving objects with surfaces, like friction, and interaction between two moving objects or more. And that comes up with momentum and collisions. And really everything that happens around us is due to interactions. So something that we need to know as we start talking about interactions is what inertia is and how we're going to use this, this word. So the inertia of an object is represented by the symbol m. You may have heard this referred to as mass. Um, that and the letter M does stand for mass, which is a concept that's related to inertia. But inertia itself means the resistance of an object to acceleration. So that is, we would think of it as the same thing as mass, but it's really not. So inertia, inertia is represented by the symbol M. The SI unit of inertia that we will use is the kilogram. And the inertial standard is this platinum iridium cylinder that's stored at the International Bureau of Weights and Measure in France. So our inertial standard is that the mass of this standard object is equal to one kilogram. Now, what happens is we start having things like carts rolling around, hitting each other, carts on frictionless tracks or just on, on surfaces, and interacting. So we're going to take a, a couple minutes on this slide here. Let's imagine that we've got in this picture, for example, cart one, the picture on the left, cart one is initially at rest, and cart two is approaching it, uh, moving at some velocity v2. So v1 is initially zero, v2 is moving towards it, and then hits the object, and at that point, V, uh, V2 stops and V1 starts moving. This is assuming that both carts are the same, have the same inertia. So let's look at these graphs. First, of course, look at the, what the graph is of. So this is position versus time, it's a picture on the left. And it shows that cart one is initially at some constant position, not moving. And cart two is initially changing its position and approaching cart one. They then interact, which in this case means collide, and cart two comes to a stop and stays at the same position. Cart one now moves off away from cart two. If you look at the slopes of the initial cart two motion and the final car one motion, you notice that the slopes are the same, and that means that their velocities were the same before and after. So we can look at the same interaction using a velocity versus time graph. Here, cart one is initially stationary, so it has a velocity of zero. Cart two is initially moving, has some constant velocity, it looks like about 0.58 or something like that. Cart, cart 2 then hits cart 1 and slows down, comes to a stop. Cart 1 is accelerated and continues to move off with the same velocity that cart 2 had initially. So these are very significant patterns here. You see the relationship between the green lines. There's the same spacing between the two velocities before and after. 
uh, they are equal before and after, and all of that is true because the inertias are the same. What happens if the inertias are different? Now let's say we have cart uh, standard, standard car here, moving along, and it hits uh, a heavier cart. It hits a double cart. So this is two carts stuck together. Right? The double cart is initially not moving, and the one that is moving is coming towards it. So we have our standard cart moving. It hits the double cart, and hmm, looks like the standard cart now has a negative velocity, which means it would have bounced off and gone back the other way, as we can see in our in our picture above. The double cart, meanwhile, was initially not moving, was struck by the standard cart, and then started to move. There are some significant things about this motion. Uh, one, the moving cart reverses direction after its collision. And two, the change in velocity of the double cart is half of the change in velocity of the standard cart. The change in velocity is this dotted line. This is the change in velocity of the double cart. This is the change in velocity of the standard cart. And the double cart, the magnitude is half as much as that of the standard cart. So you can practice here finding the change in velocity of cart 1 and cart 2 in this figure and uh, decide what the answers are. You can, this is one of the, I believe, one of the self-paced learning catalytics questions. Uh, and be careful about in the change in velocity and the sign of the change in velocity. Is it positive or negative? And this is another one. Let's find the ratio of the x components of the change in velocity. In other words, here we'd be looking, this picture is, is designed to help us, we'd be looking for the delta v, the change in velocity of the plastic cart, and it looks like delta v is negative. It ends with a negative velocity, starts with a positive velocity. Delta V of the metal cart looks like delta V is positive. It ends with positive, starts at zero. So delta V plastic divided by delta V metal is a negative number, and it's something greater than one because delta V plastic is greater than delta V metal. Pause here and write down what you think those values are, delta V plastic divided by delta V metal. What you'll, what you'll discover is that the ratio of the changes in velocities is inversely proportional to the ratio of the change in mass, and also negative. So what this says as an equation is that the mass of an unknown cart to the, to the, or the inertia of an unknown cart to the inertia of a standard cart is defined as negative the change in velocity of a standard cart to the change in velocity of an unknown cart. We can rewrite that however we want. This is our starting point for looking at relationships between, between moving objects and collisions. Notice why it's minus. So when you saw all of the previous plots one velocity increased and the other one decreased. Um, sometimes it went negative, sometimes it just stopped, but there is always an in, a negative relationship between the direction of the final, of, of the changes in velocities. All right, so some of your exercises will relate to that concept. And now we move on to one more concept, which has to do with friction and motion, and then we'll do potentially a little bit more with the uh, moving objects. So friction is a resistance to motion. The, um, the friction FET, for example, this, this can show us about friction, what friction actually is. If we take the chemistry book and we bring it really close to the physics book, you'll notice that the molecules start to get, start to move around a lot because they're heating up. And then as they stop moving against each other, they slow down. They're still moving a little bit, but they're, they're not as hot. There is not as much friction. Same, same thing if we just move around next to each other, it heats up, and then it, they relax. 
This is something that you are, you've experienced when you rub your hands together and your hands heat up. You're simply moving those molecules around and creating more, more uh, heat. So friction is defined as a resistance to motion that one surface has when moving over another. That's what that uh, FET just demonstrated. We have something like, we can, we can observe friction by seeing how speeds change. In this case, if we're sliding on ice, if we have a, a puck on ice, it probably doesn't change that much. There's, not, there's very little friction, and we can see the space between each frame in this picture stays about the same. The distance traveled in each frame stays about the same. When we have something like polished wood, there's not a whole lot of friction. And so the spacing between each frame is getting a little bit less, but not a lot less. And now if we have something like concrete, there's a lot of friction, and so the speed changes a lot, which means the spacing, uh, the position change in each frame also changes a lot. Those motion diagrams can be turned into plots of velocity versus time for each of those objects. When, when you don't have friction, things keep moving without slowing down. It, it's really, we try to create situations that are very close to frictionless, but they are never frictionless. Uh, There's almost virtually no environment is completely frictionless. However, in our spherical cow physics one world, we will create situations that are pretty close within, so that, so that our, our equations will still work. So that's why we do things like use air tracks in lab in order to minimize the friction. This FET shows what happens with friction. We'll come back to this one later, but I just want to show a quick demonstration to give you a little, a little picture of what happens with friction. Let's say we start to push this object. Well, it, there's a lot of friction between the object and the surface, and so even as we start to push, it's not moving, it's not moving. Eventually, we'll push hard enough that it will start to move. And if we stop pushing, the object slows down. So if we did that in the opposite direction, we see it eventually start to move. It looks like it's speeding up, it's speeding up. If we stop pushing, it slows down. And we will analyze the forces, but as with anything, we need a physical understanding of what's happening. So think about what happens in the presence of friction. Of friction. What direction is friction acting? Um, and let's just look at that. In fact, as the object is moving, friction is acting. Right now, the object's moving to the right. Friction's acting to the left. Friction's still acting to the left, opposite the direction of motion. OK, so as we return to a little bit more about um, changing velocity, you'll have a couple of opportunities uh, to find the, in the worksheet and in the learning catalytics question, to find the change in velocity of different objects based on these graphs. So pause here and take, take a little while to look for the change in velocity of the unknown cart relative to the change in velocity of the standard cart. Notice the absolute value in that picture or in this equation. You'll find approximately one third. This figure shows a graph of the collision between the two carts, and we saw that it was that the ratio was one third. If we wanted to find the ratio of the inertias, mu over ms, instead of delta vu over delta vs, we would use the expression that you wrote down from the one of the previous slides and find that the relationship mu to ms was equal to 3. Notice that's the inverse of 1 third. So at this point, you will go on and work on the worksheet with acceleration and incline problems. And there are a few solutions and the problems written out here. I'm going to go through them slowly. You can pause as, as you wish. I suggest you do the worksheet first and then come back to these slides.
Okay, so as you continue on from today, you'll be working on homework three, which is due tomorrow night, and starting to review more about momentum for next week. Remember that you can always find us uh, during standard office hours unless there are changes like there were today as indicated at the beginning of this, um, of this video.